Civics 101 is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. At will to the best of my ability. At will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. got a pen to take executive actions where Congress won't. I am announcing my choice today and will submit Judge Stevens' name formally. What I'm going to do when I veto this is to say yes, I'm going to send this bill right back. I'm signing today an executive order establishing the President's Task Force on Victims of Crime. A ring-a-ding-ding. What if the President picks up? Please continue to hold. What on earth is this? I called the president to make a comment, and I was on hold for about 20 minutes. It starts off the same way, huh? Much like presidencies. It's got hope at first. It comes along with a little trouble on the way. But the next thing you know, a volunteer will answer. Take my comment to the president. All comment line volunteer operators are currently assisting other callers. So did a volunteer actually end up talking to you? Yes, one did. And she told me that my comments would be delivered to the West Wing. Hmm. Because no office is untouchable by the American citizen. I hope. I'm Nick Capodice. I'm Hannah McCarthy. And this is Civics 101, our starter kit series. And today we are tackling the most powerful job in the world, or as President James K. Polk put it, no bed of roses. We're talking about the executive branch. It's one of my favorite questions that a listener submitted. What does the president do? So when I think of the executive branch, of course, the first thing I think about is the president. But there is so much more. I spoke with Lisa Mannheim. She's a lawyer and professor at University of Washington School of Law and co-author of The Limits of Presidential Power. The executive branch has about has a, uh, several million people working in it. And there are about two million people who work as civilians within the executive branch. And then there are about two million people who work in the military. Over four million? Yeah. And the president is at the very top. The Constitution gives the president the power to execute the laws. And one way of understanding what that is, is it is the power to take the laws that Congress has passed, and they might relate to food safety or education or national security. And um, those laws need to be executed. They need to be carried out and enforced. And so the president, via the Constitution, has the power to execute those laws. And what that refers to in practice is really helping to oversee a an executive branch that consists of literally millions of people um, who are doing the work of carrying out those laws passed by Congress. So this includes federal law enforcement. This is like the FBI and the Department of Justice employees, but also every member of the civil service. This is every post office worker, every national park employee. And by contrast, the legislative and the judicial branches each have about 30,000. The executive branch is the single largest employer in the world, twice as many employees as Walmart, there are hundreds of agencies that fall within the 15 departments of the executive branch. All 15 of these departments can, should, and will get their own episode. But just so you know them all, you know I'm a sucker for a good mnemonic, right, Hannah? I do. Here's a super impractical one that I adore. See that dog jump in a circle. Leave her house to entertain educated veterans' homes. See that dog jump in a circle. Leave her house to entertain educated veterans' homes. Now you're on the trolley. S-T-D-I-A-C-L-H-H-T-E-E-V-H. 15 federal departments in the order of their creation. S, State Department, handling our relationship with foreign countries. T, Treasury, they make the money, they collect taxes, they include the IRS. D, Defense, that's our largest department. 
J, justice. They enforce the laws. They protect public safety. This includes the FBI and U.S. Marshals. I, interior, manages the conservation of our land. This includes the national parks. A, agriculture, USDA. They oversee farming and food. C, commerce. They promote our economy and they handle international trade. L, labor, our workforce. H, health and human services. That includes the FDA and the CDC. They also manage Medicare and Medicaid. H, housing and urban development. HUD. They address national housing needs. T, transportation. That's federal highways and the Federal Aviation Administration. E, energy, the DOE. They manage our energy and they research better ways to make it. The next E is education. You know what they do. V is veterans affairs, benefit programs for uh, those who've served in the military. And finally, Homeland Security, whose job is to prevent and disrupt terrorist attacks within the United States. Right, Homeland Security, that's the newest one, right? It was just after September 11th. Right. And the president hires with the Senate's approval and fires without necessarily political appointees to these departments. Okay, wait, before you jump into the president, I think that you are missing something. What? Oh, right. The vice president. All right. To be fair, it's easy to overlook the vice president because the job just doesn't come with a lot of official duties. The Veep is next in succession in case anything happens to the president, a heartbeat away from the Oval Office. They also serve as president of the Senate, breaking tie votes when necessary. And that's happened about 270 times. And they preside over non-presidential impeachment trials. Um, Interestingly, when it's a presidential impeachment, it's the chief justice of the Supreme Court that runs the trial. Can you imagine that? And then over the last century, the role of the vice president has shifted a bit more towards domestic and foreign policy and sort of less sitting in that seat in the Senate as the president. Okay, thank you. So we've talked about the millions in the executive branch, but what does the president do? Okay, there are constitutional powers of the president as well as more political powers. So let's start with what's written on the parchment. Here is Lisa Mannheim again. The Constitution creates the office of the president, um, but it sort of surprisingly has relatively little to say in the actual text about the range of different powers that a president, in particular a president these days, um, has and is able to execute. That being said, there are the Constitution does include a relatively short list of specific powers that it grants to the president. And three of the most important relate to Um, laws that Congress pass, uh, who's appointed in the federal government, and then finally, um, issues that relate to foreign affairs or to the military. The first of those three powers is signing bills into law or vetoing them. Right, which Congress can override with a two-thirds majority in both houses. The second is appointing people to powerful positions in those 15 departments. Yeah, including Supreme Court justices. There are about 4,000 positions that the president appoints, 1,200 of which require Senate approval. Okay, and the third, the foreign affairs and the military, that's forming treaties with other nations and being commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Right, and there's one more constitutional power that the president, quote, shall from time to time give the Congress information of the State of the Union, which they used to call the annual address, and it used to be a written administrative report on what all the many executive employees have been up to. But radio and television have altered it to the State of the Union that we know and love today. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States! always thought that when you look at it on the page, right there in Article 2 of the Constitution, for a job that's called one of the most powerful in the world, there aren't that many powers, and they're all checked. The president appoints nominees, but the Senate approves them. The president can create or sign treaties, but two-thirds of the Senate has to concur. Did the founders intentionally make it a not very powerful position? Well, let's duck into that hot room in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention, because they all knew they wanted an executive branch, which the Articles of Confederation did not have. And they were like, we want someone like the guy running these proceedings, someone who can also lead the troops into battle, like General George Washington, like that guy. So they picked the candidate and then they wrote the job description. Yes. 
And that's one reason for our unique way that the branches divvy up war powers. The Constitution, if you want to talk about separation of powers, checks and balances there, you know, has given Congress, so the people's branch, right, and the people's house, the ability to declare a war. This is Catherine DePaolo. She's a political science professor at Florida International University. And that is very specific language, but also gave the president of the United States the power as commander in chief. And so... Once Congress declared the war, the president then was supposed to lead the troops, if you will. But that really hasn't happened at all. I mean, the last time we declared war was in World War II. There has been a consistent give and take between the legislative and executive branches when it comes to war. One of the things I find absolutely fascinating is the War Powers Resolution or the War Powers Act of 1973. And that was sort of the height of Vietnam. Um, Everyone hated this war, uh, including members of Congress. Under the Constitution, you can end the war. Not another time for this war. Stand up and do your constitutional duty. And so what they wanted to do was try to take power away from the presidency. And so they passed this law that basically says the president cannot unilaterally send troops wherever he wants to just because he's commander in chief. The, the, you know, the president has to inform Congress within 48 hours. Congress within a 60 day period has to decide if they want to continue with this war and continue to fund this, this particular war. But a lot of wars, aside from some of our recent wars, certainly in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, really wrapped up very quickly. Uh, you know, we didn't declare war, you know, when we went into Iraq the first time. And so the president really has a lot of the ability to send the troops and then say to Congress, oh, well, what are you going to do now? Right. These troops are here. So there's a lot of these things that are extra constitutional that uh, would suggest there's a strict separation of of powers here. But really, especially with the, the president of the United States in reality, can do a lot. It sounds like we are getting into the territory of executive branch loopholes. Did you ever see the Saturday Night Live parody of the I'm Just a Bill song from Schoolhouse Rock with the executive order? No. It's called an executive order. I'm an executive order and I pretty much just happened. Well, I think human nature is we always seek out those loopholes, right? So, so of course, there, there are certainly loopholes. And, you know, to talk about the presidency, certainly to go around Congress, uh, you know, especially if the president's having difficulty getting Congress past desired legislation, the president, as the chief executive of, of the executive bureaucracy, can issue executive orders and basically make a whole lot of changes. You know, President Obama couldn't get some immigration policy passed through Congress, so he signs executive orders like the DREAM Act, uh, which which kept a lot of these kids who had graduated from um, American high schools to be able to stay here. And that's an order really to uh, to the the executive branch and to um, into ICE. And so you can essentially make a lot of policy in those particular ways. To be official, executive orders need to be signed and recorded in the Federal Register, and each of them gets an official number. I love executive orders. They're fascinating. And every single president has issued them with the solitary exception of William Henry Harrison. To be fair, he did die 31 days into office. He he probably would have done a few. We dual net will never know for sure. George Washington, he did eight. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, January 1863, was technically an executive order. The record for those so far is FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 3,522 executive orders. One of those... Uh, Executive Order 7034 created the Works Progress Administration, one of the primary ways FDR sought to combat the Great Depression. But as of very recently, determining what is an executive order has become a bit muddy. When President Trump publishes a tweet, there's an argument that that is itself an executive order. It's not a formal executive order. It's not being published in the Federal Register. But legally speaking, if the president issues a clear direction and does so in the form of a tweet, that has the same legal effect as a formal executive order that's published in the Federal Register. So executive orders are just the president telling the people of the United States and all three branches of government their instructions? Yes. And these executive orders can still be blocked by the Supreme Court or by Congress if they pass a bill invalidating the order. And executive orders are different from executive agreements. Those are agreements that the president enters into with a foreign country. And so if a question is, well, why would a president ever enter into an executive agreement, which he can do on his own? 
rather than deciding to involve the Senate and uh, enter into a treaty? There are basically two answers. Um, One is that actually presidents very rarely do enter into treaties now, um, in part because they take this other route of entering into an executive agreement. Uh, The other answer is that if a president enters into an executive agreement rather than into a treaty, then it's much easier for the next president, if he wants to, to exit the executive agreement than it is to execute uh, exit a treaty. And that's one of the reasons why President Trump was able to start the unwinding process for the Paris Agreement about climate change, even though President Obama had just entered into it. George W. Bush, he submitted about 100 treaties during his administration, and most of them were approved by the Senate. And that's been pretty much the average since the beginning. By contrast, Obama submitted 38, only 15 of which were approved. However, executive agreements, which require no other branch involvement, they are on the rise. And American presidents have issued about 18,000 of those. I'm curious as to the limits of these executive orders and agreements. Can a president order anything they want? The, the fundamental principle that's underlying all of this is the idea that if the president takes an official a- action, there has to be some legal source of authority. And the legal source of authority has to come from either a law passed by Congress or from the Constitution itself. The executive agreement is the tool. The executive or- order is the tool. And it's something in, a Cong- in one of Congress's laws or in the Constitution itself that provides the basis for the president using that tool. One last thing I got to know about, um, how persistent are the effects of a president? Because if you love a president's agenda, you might want them to issue as many orders and agreements as possible. Or if you loathe an administration, you want to elect someone who will throw everything out and start anew. How long do a president's actions reverberate? That is an excellent question. Legally speaking, one way of understanding how permanent a president's actions are is to think about the process the president used to take those actions. Because for the most part, the harder it is in terms of the process for a president to take an action, the harder it is in the future going to be for a president to unwind that same action. So for example, if the president is were to sign a bill into law, That means that two houses of Congress came together and agreed on the same statutory language, which they then present to the president and the president signs it into law. For the next president to make that law go away, the president on his own cannot eliminate that prior law. By contrast, if the president takes some sort of action all on his own, so if the president decides I'm going to issue an executive order directing people in my administration to try to adopt certain enforcement priorities when it comes to immigration, or if the president says I'm going to enter into an agreement with a foreign country and I'm not going to involve the Senate, I'm not going to involve the Congress at all, I'm just going to sign it on my own. If the president does something on his own, then generally speaking, as a legal matter, the next president can come in and unwind that on his own. There are different ways you can be a president. You can be a military figurehead like George Washington, who didn't necessarily even want the job. Or you can be like Eisenhower or Kennedy. You work like crazy to broker deals with the House and Senate, getting a ton of laws passed and treaties signed. Or you can say, forget that. I'm going to just go it alone and use those presidential powers. But again, Congress can pass legislation to overturn an executive order and the courts can deem them unconstitutional. Uh, For example, Donald Trump's travel ban was an executive order that a judge ruled against the law and no individual action on the part of the president could change that. Until he wrote another executive order, which the Supreme Court upheld. Yeah. There's sort of one last vestige of the power of the president that Lisa told me about. And the thing is, it depends on how powerful we let the president be. Given the 
role that the president plays as, in a sense, the single person that the news can go to, that people can look to, that foreign countries can can refer to in thinking about what the Fed- the United States government means and what it's doing. Um, in light of that position that the president plays, the president has, over time, gained an enormous amount of, in a sense, political power. And this didn't happen overnight. Administration to administration, presidents have set precedent that gives the office more power. And we have no idea how that will evolve in the next 250 years. But I will say, presidents often add tools to their executive toolbox, but very rarely take them out. Well, that'll just about do it for today's episode on the executive branch. Today's episode was produced by me, Nick Capodice, with you, Hannah McCarthy. Thank you. Our staff, you're welcome. Our staff includes Jackie Helbert and Ben Henry. Erica Janik is our executive producer, which means she executes the episode. And Maureen McMurray's job description was written after she was hired. Music in this episode is by Supercontinents, Pictures of a Floating World, Bizu, Daniel Birch, Chris Zabriskie, Ask Again, Asura, and the United States Coast Guard Band. This here is Tone Ranger. Civics 101 is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and is a production of NHPR, New Hampshire Public Radio. And don't you forget, you too can call the president to make a comment. 202-456-1111. The expected wait time to speak with an operator is currently greater than eight minutes. A little rain early next week, but the weekend should be good with clear skies and highs in the high 70s and low 80s. Monday seems to be foggy and humid with a high of 81. Rainy week coming up. June showers. Bring desperate hours.